So the two areas that we found to be most impaired in our adults were school, followed by work. The third domain was interpersonal. And you can see here the kinds of complaints we got in interviewing our adults with ADHD. And notice that these adults are aware that this may be happening in their relationships, but find it very difficult to inhibit this behavior anyway. So that they may be very sincere when they say, I really will try harder, I'll try not to say things off the cuff, I'll try not to say offensive things, and then find that they do it anyway because of the inhibitory deficit that you see here. And as we've talked about problems with verbal eloquence, if you will, with getting to the point, with being able to explain things, the inability to regulate emotion. By the way, the most impairing deficit out of all of these in terms of its social impact is the emotional one. People forgive distractibility. They forgive verbiage. They will forgive impulsive decision-making. They will not forgive anger. <clears throat> and so we found the single best predictor, both in our children and our adults, of friendship problems, marital difficulties, and dating problems was the emotional aspect of the disorder, not the cognitive or executive aspect of the disorder. So something to keep in mind because we, I think, undervalue the importance of emotion in ADHD as I taught yesterday. It's a, a very important piece of the ADHD puzzle because it brings with it its own impairments and its own risks, independent of the working memory and executive problems. And you can see here the difficulties with following through on promises and commitments. I was interviewing a young man once and he said, you know, I can't tell you how many dates <clears throat> I have lost because of my inability to deal with time. I would make a date to meet a young woman in front of the movie theater at 8 o'clock on a Friday night. And this was someone I was really interested in and she seemed to reciprocate that interest and it looked like this might go somewhere. And then I forgot when 8 o'clock was. And on Friday night at 8 o'clock, this woman is standing alone in front of a theater waiting for someone who promised her a date. People don't forgive that. It doesn't matter what you say happened. And you can say, I have ADHD, I lost track of time, I didn't build in the time it would take me to get across town, I wasn't thinking about the weather or the traffic or the density or the fact that parking was going to be a problem because other people are coming to this megaplex. It doesn't matter what your excuses are. The date's over. It is very unlikely you would be given a second chance. People interpret this lack of timeliness as a moral failing or as a lack of interest in the other person. And it's very hard for them to forgive that kind of social slight. So you can begin to see the kind of things that are affecting the social quality, the social life of these individuals. I probably don't need to tell you these things. <clears throat> Other things we heard from our adults, as you see here, was the talking too much, too loudly, and not listening to other people's side of the conversation. The spouses we interviewed, the married partners of our adults with ADHD, often said that they felt unappreciated, unlistened to, <clears throat> that the conversations tended to be one way, largely the adult ADHD to someone else, and not a lot of reciprocity and turn-taking and sharing. Uh, and this, too, can contribute to relationship dissatisfaction. So just something to pay attention to here. This is one that most adults with ADHD don't seem to appreciate, but those of us who deal with them certainly do. And that is the social stickiness, the inability to take social cues and to terminate the interaction when it's most appropriate. This is that perseverative behavior we talked about. You may find a conversation with somebody very interesting, and you may continue it on and on, but the person is giving you a lot of not-so-subtle cues that we need to wrap this up and I need to get on with this. But instead, the conversation just continues. And I've had adults follow me out of conference rooms all the way into the parking lot, <laughs> not realizing I got to get to my plane. You know, <clears throat> It's all very innocent enough, but it can add to the uh, social difficulties of individuals with this disorder. So you can see some of the things that we've already talked about here. Now, one of the things that our group was one of the first to discover, probably because we're all perverts, but we looked at sexual activity in our children growing up, and then again in these clinic-referred adults as well, and we found exactly the same pattern. They mapped onto each other beautifully. There is no increase in sexual deviance among people with ADHD, not as teenagers growing up and certainly not as adults. What there was was this striking pattern of risk-taking. 
seen in having sexual encounters earlier than other people did, about a year earlier, starting their sexual lives, their uh, sexual intercourse. We found that they were far less likely to employ contraception because they tended to have impulsive encounters with other people. <clears throat> Even if they were in a committed relationship, they were five times more likely to have had affairs outside the relationship on impulse than other people were likely to do. <clears throat> if you have more encounters sexually and you don't, don't use contraception, well, the result is babies. And so there was a nine to tenfold increase in having had a teen pregnancy or having initiated one as the father or had one as the mother. 38% of our boys had had a baby before 19 years of age and 68% of our girls. So we were among the first, and it's now been documented in three other studies, that having ADHD results in starting your family nearly eight years earlier than the general population, sometimes 10. Most people wait until their late 20s to early 30s these days to begin having children. People with ADHD tend to have their children quite young. And their children with ADHD go on to grow up and have their children quite young. So we have shown in our longitudinal studies this is a cross-generational effect. Starting to have children when you may not be necessarily ready to have uh, children or to be able to support them in the way that you would like to do so. <clears throat> By the way, teen pregnancies are very costly to society. They are some of the highest risk pregnancies of all pregnancies. Uh, and so it's no surprise that there is a huge economic impact of these adolescent pregnancies. <clears throat> so we have now found that the single best predictor of who's going to have a teen pregnancy is ADHD. So my friend Eric Mash at Calgary has now gone into homes for unwed mothers and screened all of these teenage pregnant girls and is finding a nearly eight-fold increase in the prevalence of ADHD in these homes. It's probably even higher than that because he's using self-report and self-reports of ADHD are not reliable until you're about 30 years of age. Most of our follow-up studies have found that people growing up with ADHD have a very limited awareness of their ADHD and often have a positive bias about their lives and their functioning that doesn't really resolve itself until they get into their third or fourth decade of life when they start to agree with other people about how serious their impairments actually are. But prior to that time, most of the kids we followed into adulthood in their late teens and 20s did not see themselves as having a disorder or symptoms of a problem. It wasn't until they hit their late 20s to early 30s that they began to wake up and smell the coffee and realize that much of what was happening in their life was the result of this disorder that could no longer be denied. Uh, and we still see this even in adults after 30, this somewhat positive illusory bias about how well versus how poorly they're functioning in certain areas of life. So for this reason, don't be surprised if when you see a clinician, they will want to interview someone who knows you well. And that is to make sure that we are detecting the degree of the disorder accurately, whether it's interviewing parents, siblings, friends, partners, spouses, or just looking for the paper trail of impairment in your life, it needs to be corroborated. Uh, and we teach that now as part of our uh, teaching clinicians about assessing adults with ADHD. You always corroborate their reports. Because the tendency isn't for malingering and over-reporting. The tendency is for under-reporting of symptoms and impairments, and you don't want to be dismissing the disorder when it's really there. Now, there is one exception to the rule, and that is college students. One in four college students in the U.S., and also here in Canada, seeking accommodations in the university around exams and other aspects of college life is malingering. So we teach people, if you work in a university counseling center and these college students are coming in, one in four is faking the disorder to get the Vyvanse, to get the Adderall, to get the Ritalin, to get the Concerta, to get the accommodations, the extra time, and all the other things that, at least in the U.S., university students are eligible for under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we teach people that there is a very special area where malingering seems to be at its highest, and that is on the college campus. Driving is an area that has been well studied in adult ADHD, probably better than any other domain, believe it or not. We have more research on driving than any other. And when we look at driving, we see that even at operating the vehicle itself, even at this very basic cognitive motor level, we see differences between ADHD and the general population. Poor steering, not able to keep the car in its lane as well as other people whether that's inattention or the motor coordination or both, but there is a little bit of veering 
with the vehicle, and we even pick it up in our simulators. Also, very poor reaction time to critical events that happen around the individual. I had a $100,000 simulator for a while that I was using to assess adults with ADHD, and we were able to pick up all of these very minute differences in just how they maneuver the vehicle. One of the things that was striking <clears throat> that I haven't seen other people talk about so much, but we saw it in our simulator firsthand, we would start to throw critical events. I could sit at a computer and I could start to create hazards around you while you're driving in our simulated Ford Victoria, Crown Victoria, and what we found is that when a critical event happened, the general population slows down and allows the event to play out in front of them so that they can deal with it. The individuals with ADHD were likely to have a critical event, and their reaction was, get the hell out of here. <laughs> and so they would speed up and drive around it and pass it. Or there'd be a guy coming onto the side ramp, and instead of moving over, slowing down, and waving him in so you can take charge of this situation, they're racing the guy, right? <laughs> Oh, you think you're getting in here, do you, buddy? On the speedometer, there he goes. And the two of them are fighting to let this guy in on the 401 or whatever your freeway is out here. We would have pedestrians walk out in front of them, and they would veer and go up on the sidewalk. <laughs> Instead of just breaking for a moment and allowing the guy to pass, it was like, I can't be bothered with this. Get out of my way, up on the sidewalk. No wonder that one of my dissertation students, Tracy Richards, showed that road rage is a very common problem in adult ADHD driving. This use of the vehicle to express anger at other people and to coerce other people if you've been frustrated while you're driving. So that's something to keep in mind as well, and it was very much predicted by the emotional dimension of ADHD. In one of our studies, we took our adult drivers out for an hour around the city of Milwaukee with a driving instructor who had a 55-page checklist of driving behavior. Two of them quit. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest rated the drivers as being extraordinarily impulsive. And uh, several of them recommended that the people have their licenses revoked. We're not going to do that because it was a research project. But nevertheless, it is palpable, these driving problems. This is not subtle in what we see about the driving uh, in these individuals. And of course, we also found when we interviewed their parents that these children had taken the cars of their parents even before they were licensed to drive. Even at 14, 15, the parents would go out, there'd be a vehicle left there with a set of car keys, and the kids would go joyriding with uh, the vehicle. As a result of all of these problems with driving, people with ADHD have two to three times the accident rate of other drivers. They have more crashes in their career and they have more speeding citations as well. And the accidents they have are nearly three times as bad in terms of the damage caused and the injuries to other people. So this is not trivial. This is a very severe area of impairment produced by this disorder. So no surprise, over the first eight years of their driving careers, they had their license suspended three times more often than other adults are likely to do. This is unmedicated. This is unmedicated. In fact, everything I'm telling you is unmedicated. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to talk about that. Okay. So I, I want you to appreciate that while driving is a very boring area to discuss in an audience like this, this is a very life-threatening area of adult functioning. Some of our patients are now doing jail time for vehicular homicide because of their killing other people. A uh, case in January in Atlanta is a young 17-year-old girl off her Adderall on the weekend, as some pediatricians are still want to do. By the way, that's out-of-date practice. We don't do drug holidays anymore. But this young lady was off her medication, out joyriding and text messaging while she was driving, and she hit a pedestrian, and she killed him. Now, no court in the U.S. has ever used or allowed ADHD to be used as an excuse for homicide, for vehicular, uh, for negligence in this case. So um, she's doing eight to ten years now for this particular, and I have other patients in Massachusetts who are doing much the same thing. So I just want you to appreciate that this is a serious area of impairment that needs to be treated. So serious, in fact, that the Canadian Pediatric Association has now recommended that if pediatricians in your country see a teenager whose ADHD is at least of moderate severity, they are compelled to medicate that teenager while they start their driving career. It is something with which I handily agree because, you see, this struck my life. It will be three years ago, July the 25th. 
when at 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from the state police in upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains telling me that my twin brother with ADHD is dead. And he has died in a car accident. And he is off his medication. He had been drinking. He was speeding. He was out joyriding at about 10 o'clock at night on a dirt road in the Adirondack Mountains, a dirt road that can only tolerate about 25 miles an hour. He was only doing 40, and he should have survived the accident. But you see, my brother never wore a seatbelt, and he didn't drive particularly safe. And he was usually highly distracted. He was a musician, and he usually had music playing in the car as well. We don't quite know what happened. What we do know is that as he descended through a turn, he rolled his vehicle, and he was thrown out and crushed. And so I can speak personally to the the adverse outcomes that the effect of ADHD can have in people's lives on driving. My brother isn't the only one to die in an accident from their ADHD. A study published just a month ago shows that if you have ADHD, you are three times more likely to be dead before you're 43 years of age. So this is a life-threatening disorder, and most of that, at least in the earlier years, is coming through accidental injury. In the later years, it's going to come from two other sources. But suffice to say, I very personally now believe that people with ADHD need to be treated when they drive. And I hope you take it seriously as well. <clears throat> you can see here the results of our study at UMass. Once again, the adults with ADHD not only are more likely to experience a driving problem, but to do so much more often. It's the frequency. Everybody has an accident, including a little fender bender, but they don't have as many, and their accidents aren't as severe, and they don't encounter speeding tickets anywhere near the degree that other people do. By the way, parking is another frequent violation. <clears throat> do you know why? Because you're too impatient to find a parking spot. So you double park a lot. So when you're getting your dry cleaning, when you just want to run in and get a carton of milk or whatever, if there's no spot there, well, you make your own. <clears throat> And then you get ticketed for doing so. So that was the second biggest area other than speeding and associated crashes. Many studies, including my own, have found uh, children with ADHD as they grow up to participate in a variety of antisocial activities. The Satterfield studies were among the first to show this. It's been found in every longitudinal study. Now, I do want to emphasize that most of this activity is predicted by the onset of conduct disorder in the adolescent years, so that ADHD alone is not as likely to predispose to these activities as ADHD is with conduct disorder. But even allowing for that, the subset of kids who go on to become raging delinquents in the community, we did find there was a subset of antisocial activity that ADHD alone was sufficient to predispose to. And that was using drugs, possessing drugs, <clears throat> selling drugs, and stealing to get the drugs or the money they needed for their substance use problems. So while you may think of these as largely victimless crimes, which for the most part they are, there is a set of antisocial activities that ADHD alone does predispose people to. But as far as the violent crimes, the muggings, the rapes, the fire setting, the carrying and using weapons, the bar fights, and so on, it's pretty much determined by whether or not you also had developed conduct disorder when you were young. ADHD alone was not a predictor of these sorts of things. And by the way, it wasn't just in their adolescent or adult years. This is going back below age 12. And you can see here, the black bar is higher than the other bars in terms of frequency with which these individuals were likely, or not frequency, but rather the percentage with which they were likely to have engaged in these encounters. Now, this is whether or not you've ever used a particular drug. And of course, there's not an awful lot of differences here across these bars, except you see cocaine and LSD. But that's because this is, did you ever once try these things? And even the general population tries some of this stuff. So do people with other psychiatric disorders. It's the frequency that separates the adult with ADHD. So let me tell you the three drugs of choice that we found were problematic for most of the adults we saw. Nicotine was number one. ADHD in adulthood predisposes to nicotine addiction. Why? Because nicotine treats ADHD. In fact, we have three drug companies now that are exploring variations of the nicotine molecule as the next wave of drugs for treating ADHD. The problem they're having is that when they split off the part of the molecule that is addictive, it also tends to be the part of the molecule that is also beneficial. So they still have some work to do, but there are drugs in the pipeline that are nicotinic receptor drugs. 
So we find that when teens with ADHD start smoking for the various reasons people start, whether it's peer influence or to be cool or because some celebrity is doing it, they will rapidly accelerate their reliance on nicotine because it, they self-medicate. It does treat their disorder, but they're treating their disorder with a highly addictive and carcinogenic drug. But it does work. And so one reason we find that they are predisposed to nicotine use is that it does help them. But alcohol was the second best drug that they were using in terms of its frequency, okay? And alcohol is not a form of self-medication. It does not help ADHD. It actually makes it worse because the initial phase of the biphasic effect of alcohol is disinhibition. So that when you first start drinking, the effect on the brain is disinhibitory. Only when you've consumed enough alcohol does it become sedative, but its initial effects are a releasing effect. You've already got somebody with an inhibition deficit. You can expect to see a lot of disinhibition in the first phase of alcohol use. So we found that mainly the adults with ADHD were drinking for the same reason that other adults were drinking excessively, and that is that alcohol narrows the scope of time. The more you drink, the more you live in the now. And alcohol has this wonderful telescoping effect on our sense of time and the future. So probably the reason they're doing it is to forget. They've had a lot of trouble, they've had some failures, and they start to use alcohol to just block out all of the rest of that life and just kind of live in the moment, here in the bar, peeling the label, off the Bud Light, and kind of enjoying the company. You know, it's a means of forgetting your problems, but it's certainly not self-medication. The third drug of choice, which we believe acts the same way that alcohol does, was marijuana. Adults with ADHD were using marijuana far in excess of other adults. Even if they hadn't developed a dependency or an addiction to it under the DSM rules, they were still using it much more frequently than other people do. Again, probably to help with their coping of their lives, of failures and other problems that they might be experiencing. Now, we were the first study to do complete physical exams on all of our adults with ADHD, including urinalysis and lipid profiles. And what we found in the life course of these individuals was a growing risk for primary care health disorders. And you can see it here across the board. Sleeping problems, difficulties with uh, medications. By the way, medical is the illegal use of prescription drugs. So across the board, their lifestyle and their health risks were becoming increasing concerns uh, to them and to us the older that they were getting. So we found there was an increased risk of accidental injuries, even in adult life, that was producing medical problems for them. We also found that there was a drift toward a more couch potato, leisurely lifestyle, that people with ADHD were more likely to allow visual media to be sources of distraction in their lives, whether it's text messaging or cell phoning or video gaming or watching television. They were more likely to be doing those things than other people do, and they were less likely to be engaged in advanced education, reading for pleasure, self-improvement, exercising, the other things for which we usually believe self-discipline is going to be required. So if you were in primary care and I described that lifestyle to you, there would be things that you might predict as a consequence of that. One of them is obesity, and that's what we found. As we followed our kids into adulthood and as we studied the adults who came to our clinic, we found that there was a growing risk for increased body mass index and frank obesity. In fact, there are now three studies that have found that women with ADHD have a markedly higher rate of bulimia, the, uh, the impulsive eating disorder. Not anorexia, not the restrictive kind, but the impulsive kind, the binge eating purging uh, that is often the case with bulimia. 16 to 22 percent of adult women with ADHD are bulimics. So there are eating disorders that are associated with this, and whether you're male or female, there is a growing risk of obesity problems in these adults, not with all of them. Uh, and by the way, this is the first generation we've seen that. Earlier follow-up studies did not document that, but it may have to do with the availability of fast food over the last 20 to 40 years as becoming more and more ubiquitous in life. The impulsive foods that are there all the time and can be garnered very easily may be contributing to this. It's, it's not clear. 
We did find that there were more dental problems in our adults, that they were less likely to be engaged in preventive medical and dental care, leading to difficulties. Uh, my brother was a classic uh, example of that, allowing his teeth to become so badly decayed that he developed infections, and damn near killed himself a few years earlier than he finally did because of sepsis. One of his teeth had become so infected that uh, he had to be treated for a systemic infection that had developed. You can die from infected teeth. Uh, so they seem to not take the steps to engage the preventive aspect of medicine, the annual visits to the physician, the six-month dental cleanings, and so on. Some of this has to do with financial differences. As we found, adults with ADHD weren't earning quite as much money as other adults in our studies. But some of it also has to do with the forethought the foresightedness that is required in order to use preventive medical and dental care. We found extraordinary money problems among our adults, as you will see here, particularly in these areas. Many of them weren't saving anything for retirement, found it difficult to save at all for anything. Impulse buying with credit cards was a major problem for some of our adults. Having their utilities shut off for non-payment, very common story in the history of the adults that we saw. And then, of course, having their cars repossessed, which you don't see here, uh, was another aspect of these financial problems. So no surprise, when you give impulsive people access to money and credit, you may find that they don't necessarily manage that as responsibly or as well uh, as they should. Finally, as you see down here, we are the first study to document a growing risk for coronary heart disease. ADHD predisposes to CHD making it a public health problem, not just a public mental health problem. Uh, in fact, we also now have data to show that it's going to predispose to cancer if it's not treated because of the increased smoking and drinking and uh, poor nutrition. On top of that, of course, the problems with weight. It's easy to see how those would contribute to risk for coronary heart disease. And, and even at as young as 27, we are showing that young people with ADHD have a marked increased risk for heart disease even at this very young age, than do people in the general population. So we have now written in our book that ADHD, if it is left untreated, will probably shorten an individual's life expectancy. We have several studies that attest to that. Let me explain one to you. There's a life course study that was done in California that followed thousands of individuals from birth to death and documented the death by all causes and found that the single best predictor from childhood onward that beat out all other predictors of life expectancy was childhood impulsiveness. The more impulsive you are as a child, the shorter your life is going to be. Now, they classified impulsive people as falling in the bottom 25% of their population. And they found that it had shortened the life of these individuals by eight years. <clears throat> That's the lowest 25%. ADHD is the most severe 5%. So it doesn't take a genius to see that if being in the lowest quartile shortens your life by eight years, being in the lowest 5% is probably shortening it even more. So we are now arguing that adult ADHD, if left untreated, is a public health issue, not just a mental health issue. <clears throat> we studied the offspring of our adults with ADHD because it's a genetic disorder for the most part, as I explained this morning. And we found what everybody else has found, including the Montreal Children's Hospital study of adult ADHD and all other studies of families with ADHD. Forty percent of the children that had been born to our adults with ADHD had ADHD themselves. By the way, the next highest disorder besides ADHD was oppositional disorder. Whether the children had ADHD or not, ODD was likely to be there in nearly half of the children born to adults with ADHD. Now, why might that be? <clears throat> because part of the risk for oppositional disorder is disrupted parenting. Parents who use consequences inconsistently and impulsively, and parents who use high rates of expressed emotion with an individual. And all of those would be predicted if we knew that a parent had adult ADHD. We would expect them to be more impulsive, more emotional, less consistent in the way they manage their children. And so, no surprise, we would see ODD as a correlate of this parenting pattern, not just the genetic risk for ADHD as well.